Hello everybody and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ken Goodman. I'm uh, on the committee of the Sibsi Ashray group, which is a group that was set up to try and bring the information of Sibsi and Ashray together. Um, normally Sibsi Ashray have a number of events every year. Uh, they're streamed online to members. Uh, sibsiashray.org is the website. All of the talks will be put up there afterwards. So if you ever wanted to look at what they do, it's a wide range of topics. This year um, and last year we had a Sibsi Ashray topic here in Ireland, trying to bring Sibsi Ashray talks more to the Ireland and to the Irish market. So this year we got John and Paul to talk about CHP uh, and alternative fuels. We were looking at maybe expanding it a bit more, so I think John's slides, you cover quite a lot in to do with CHP. Uh, Paul is going to talk uh, briefly, 10-15 minutes, on CHP in Ireland, what's available from the SEAI, and what angle the SEAI have on CHP. CHP, I think, and Paul, you can correct me if I'm wrong, more than likely I am, CHP in Ireland uh, hasn't had the uptake that I think we could here have in, in Ireland, specifically with the pharmaceutical and the larger industrial clients around the country. Uh, it's a great technology, I've seen it working, um, specifically if you have a, a constant uh, heating load, um, you get free electricity. But I'll let these guys uh, talk about it, I'm not by any means an expert in it. So without further ado, may I introduce Paul Martin. So. Paul is the uh, SEI Programme Manager, and he's also the Sibsi Ireland Chair. Thank you. How you doing? Thank you, Ken, for having us here today. Uh, yeah, I'm from SCAI's Technical Standards Development Manager, Programme Manager, not manager yet, and uh, I'm currently Sibsi Ireland Chairperson. So uh, Ken asked if I could get some people to talk from SEAI and all of those three people can't make it. So I'm gonna try and combine my talk of the three people on what they know, and I'll just give you a bit of a, an idea of where SEAI and Ireland are going uh, in terms of CHP. I'm also gonna speak a little bit about the SSRH, which is the support scheme for renewable heat, which in other districts would have been called the RHI. So that uh, was announced in 2017. So I'll give you a little bit of an outline on that. It's still very much in its infancy, but uh, I can, we can talk around it anyway today. So again, the three people that were going to be here was Matthew Clancy, who was head of CHP and Biomass, and uh, Ray Langton, who was in charge of the SSRH scheme, and Martin Howley from Cork, who's in charge of our statistics and everything. So I'm just going to start with an intro about the trends around uh, CHP. Then I'm going to talk about the support available around CHP in Ireland currently, and then around the support scheme for renewable heat. So the current trends, <clears throat> so that's the line of where CHP is uh, at the moment. Uh, currently we have a growth rate of about 2.1%. You'll see that there's a real spike there in 2005 and that's with Aganish Aluminum in Limerick. So pitching along there, we're looking at Overall installations currently around 350 megawatts E, and by 2020 we're looking at about 450. And then to kind of break it down into the two areas, and, and the slides that I'm taking from here are actually from the CHP um, document, the 2007 report that was done by Martin Howley. So this is all fully available down on SEAI's website. But when you look at the food, the large industry, the food and pharma, you can see the various areas that it takes. Uh, we talked about Aganish down in Limerick, and that is where the, the major installation is in this country, and it totals <coughs> about 47 uh, in total. Then if we look mainly around CHP in smaller areas, such as district heating in hotels, with the swimming pools and all the rest in the nursing homes, we're talking about 234. So it's a lower capacity of the heat pump, which is more common in Ireland. And then, this is just a, s a short slide based on what kind of fuels uh, dominate or feed the CHP unit. As you can see, the majority, and I know John is going to go into it a bit later, the majority of this is natural gas, while we see that um, there are a few, that the most there would be biogas as well. So um, there is an increase, a slight increase. 
So this slide here, again, from the 2017 report, will show the penetration in relation to district heating systems. As you all know, district heating systems aren't that common in Ireland, so we're in kind of about 7.5% compared to other European countries. On this slide here, this is uh, how the Commission of Utility Regulation recognises CHP. So it recognises it under its scheme as being useful heat. Uh, they'll want, if you want to kind of register your installation, they'll want access to the data. You'll have to report annually and also there'll be audits carried out on your installation. And that will tie into another area around uh, the, the tax credits that you can get on that. So support for CHP. SEI currently have the EEOS scheme. And this scheme has been running for a number of years now. And this is around where the polluter pays. So all of your utility companies, etc., are trying, they have, they have a, the more fuel that they say in, in terms of carbon, the more they have to give back in terms of energy efficient uh, installations. So the EOS has kind of three areas. It would have fuel poor, it would have domestic installations. You'll probably see a lot of, uh, I was going to name them, but I can't, kind of utility suppliers knocking on the door saying, we can give you, we can insulate your house, we can do this. That's all because of the targets they, that they have to achieve. But they also have an industrial or a commercial target as well. And this is where CHP comes in. So we do recognise CHP. Um, and we would see it not too different from uh, the utility regulator in terms of when we give you credits for it, it must be your own heat that you're using in your area. We have a calculator on the SEAI website. It's based around Annex 2 of the Energy Efficiency Directive 2012. Um, so we're, we want to make sure that the heat that you are creating under CHP is not dumped. Um, so what is this scheme really it's it's kind of as much you'll get involved with the utility suppliers and they will give you financial support and technical support around your chp if you're thinking of inputting it into a uh, into a unit the tax relief is not my expertise so i'm just going to leave the slide up there in terms it is recognized if you look at the kind of the utility regulator there it certifies the CHP plants and you can get full tax relief in terms of the carbon tax that is based around the fuel. So, the interesting one, or new, the new uh, show in town is the SSRH. As I said, it's very much along the lines of the RHI that was in the UK, but we have a chance to learn from the mistakes that were made and from all the good installations that were there as well. So the government announced in December 2017 that SEAI would administer the scheme and we developed the programme. So we're still very much in the development stage of the programme. We're still dealing with the terms and conditions of that programme. In other words, what size of unit should you have, etc., etc. What technical standards are based around that? What are we expecting you to do? So earlier on, we can see that it's really around standards and standards of installations, where other installations would have felt would have been in relation to buildings that were poorly insulated. That won't be a part. We more than likely have a minimum BER that you're going to have for that building. So we make sure that that in energy efficient heat that you're using is being used to the best access, and it's not just heat in a draft as such. And uh, I was going to say something else, but I can't remember. Anyway, I'll move on. So the target really is to, we're looking at about three percentage points that we need to increase. And this is all based around naturally our European targets that we need to meet. So there'll be financial support for the installation. And naturally, as I said before, they'll all be energy efficient installations. Like I gave you the example of the factory or the commercial building that needs to be insulated that little bit more than it normally is. We also, if let's say um, biomass is being used for a process, we would want to make sure that all of those pipes are properly insulated, that there's energy efficient pumps, etc., etc., on that unit. So, the core principles of the scheme I kind of explained already really are based around rigorous standards uh, in terms of we'll be looking naturally the building regulations, we can't contradict them. 
We have the construction products installation. There's EN standards, there's SIBSI guides, there's ASHRAE guides. All these type of guides will be used. Air quality standards as well, because now we're kind of, we're talking about, some, I should have said at the start when I'm talking about SSRH, this doesn't include CHP, but naturally a biomass installation will have a great add-on to that is CHP. So these kind of things uh, all work together. So we have to make sure the designers and the installators are competent uh, and receipts of payment, things like this will be uh, subject to tax clearance. So where is the scheme going at the moment? It's looking at two primary technologies at the moment. It is looking at heat pumps where there'll be an upfront grant. Uh, we're still working out the levels and how to give that grant for the best value for the Irish consumer and the biomass side of the grant will be based on a tariff or you will be paid per unit of heat that you used energy efficiency energy efficient heat so there naturally there will be all this eligi eligibility that we'll be talking about and um it looks like the scheme will start off slow but it will build as they say as the as the installation start off so there will be a mentoring scheme there, so we're not just asking people just to install, install any, any old biomass scheme uh, into their commercial buildings. So SEAI, as I say, we're in the very early days, but we are speaking to a lot of consultants who were involved in the RHI scheme over in the UK, talking about the standards that they use. Naturally, there's a legal and procurement side around all of this. There's communications, our website will need to be updated a lot more to support people in terms of guidance, what to do, information for planners, information for business owners, maybe there will be in information on how to fund these type of schemes. And we're going to have to inspect a lot of these schemes as well. So we're taking on, we're taking on quite a lot here. So we'll be going out making sure reading the heat meters for a biomass unit, let's just say. And we'll be making sure that those units are, you know, whether they're to the Norwegian standard or whether to the UK, like the Norwegian standard would have it locked so you can't tamper with it, but the UK you could just pull out the probe and all of a sudden it was clicking up money in terms of uh, energy and you were being paid for it. Again, we'll be the HR side of it, the finance and the IT side of it as well. So these are all the kind of areas that SCAI are taking on in this. Again, if you were to ask me when will it start, more than likely we are drawing up the kind of T's and C's at the moment with the Department of Energy. So we're reporting those to them. Uh, they will decide on if they're acceptable or not. And then we move into the scheme. So more than likely we'll be looking into the second half of the year before you'll see any of these schemes coming online, being assessed. It's important that at this stage there's going to be no grandfathering rule so what that means is that any existing installation that is there will not be incentivized that's not in stone but that's the way it more than likely is going ken can pass on the slides or i know the gentleman from engineers ireland who's controlling this in a laptop up in the cafe <laughs> is he's going to send out the slides so all the links will be there so primarily the links, as I said, do take a look at the CHP report 2007, as I said, I know John will be referring to it. And that is all I have to say. If you have any questions from me, if I can't answer them, I will pass them on to my colleagues. Ken will take your details as I have to run off uh, to another event tonight. So thank you very much for your time. Does anyone have any questions? No, just uh, I, we do um, have a, an online audience as well. So if anybody is online, can hear me and probably can see me. Um, if you would send me an email and I with your question, and I will get it responded to. That's great. Yeah. Thank, thank, you, thank, you very, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the second speaker is Mr. John Hyde. John is the National sale ma Sales Manager for Centrica Business Solutions. John is a mechanical and manufacturing engineer with over 10 years experience in the USA, the UK and Ireland in low carbon technology industries. He's an experience in a full range of district heating technologies, metering, tariffs and escort services within Centrica. John manages a team to deliver CHP solutions to their clients in both the UK and Ireland in the commercial, residential, 
district heating, food, beverage, manufacturing, healthcare, and pharmaceutical <coughs> sectors. So without further ado, John. Thanks, Ken. And thank you, Paul. That was very insightful. Let me just get my slides. Yep. Um, so thank you for inviting me along today. Um, as Ken has already said, I'm from Centrica Business Solutions. Um, raise your hands. Does anybody know who Centrica is or what we do? Two? Two people? Okay. Well, Centrica is the... Uh, the uh, owning company um, that we own British Gas, Borgosh, uh, and Direct Energy in the US. So we have a turnover of about 30 billion per annum. And the company I work for is Energy Combined Power, and we were acquired by Centrica in 2016. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is combined heat and power. Um, I'm going to give you an introduction to it. I'm going to move quickly along. Uh, I have quite a lot of slides, uh, so I hope I keep you entertained. If anybody has any question and they want to just shout out there, go for it, you know. I'd want this to be that by PowerPoint. I want to have a bit of, a, a bit of banter, okay? So, um, so we'll move on. Um, check out our websites. We have a lot on there. There's a lot of videos and things you can have a look at. And it really kind of simplifies the kind of utility world that we operate in. So, so please check that out. Uh, this is a list of the contents we're going to look at. There's nine sections here. I think we'll get to probably section seven in an hour, uh, but maybe we'll take a vote at the end of that, and if you want me to continue, I can. But uh, I think we can hang around afterwards, can, can't we? There's a nice uh, establishment here that we can uh, have a refreshment and chat further. So just to give you a quick overview of who we are, because only two people here know us, um, we are, the company I work for uh, directly is Energy Combined Power, and we've been a CHP manufacturer in Manchester for 35 years. And as I said earlier, we were acquired by Centrica, and now we uh, work all over the world. Um, yeah, so, so we distribute CHP um, into America, into Japan, Australia, and we have a big install base in Ireland uh, with Temp Technology, um, and we also have a big install base in Europe too. So Temp Technology is our partner here um, that provides CHP service, operation, and maintenance, and they're based in Limerick. Uh, Robert Brockert is here today from Temp Technology, if anybody wants to speak to him later. So in Ireland, uh, we have over 200 installations of small-scale CHP, uh, and we've been working with Temp Technology for about 25 years. So a very solid partner. Um, these are some of the installations. So we work with Kerry Group, we work with the Health Board, um, a lot of hotel industry, and leisure centre. So if we think back to Paul's slides earlier about the different sectors, you could see that uh, there's a lot of leisure and hotel and industry there. Also a lot of government buildings as well. Uh, these are some of the people we deal with. Okay. So we end up dealing with them uh, on a long-term basis after installation, after uh, practical completion. It's about running a CHP. And I think people... Uh, need to know more about what happens to a CHP over, over its lifetime. We're talking about uh, 10 to 15 years the CHP is running. Um, what I'm talking about mainly today is reciprocating engines. And those engines are, are like your car. And if your car was running like these engines 24-7, 365, is the equivalent of 300,000 miles around the world. So if your car was getting maintained at every 50,000 miles, you'd be in there about six times. So it doesn't translate as simple as that, but what it does add up to is a lot of maintenance uh, for the generation on site. But I'll get into that in a bit more detail. So why, why are we talking about CHP? Okay, what's the, what's the big deal with CHP? I suppose people are hearing it more and more now, are you? CHP popping up maybe on planning applications, carbon, things like that. And this is a question for the audience now. I'm going to try and get you talking, you know. I prefer to have a bit of a two-way communication. I don't like the sound of my own voice too much. So, CHP, does anybody want to show hands? Is it a generator? A few people? A boiler? You're ruining it, mister, you know? <laughs> He's right. He said both. Um, you know, it's a trick question, and I knew guys like you would, uh, and ladies would know this. CHP comes about from the combined output 
from burning a fuel and utilizing the heat from the jacket and the exhaust while also turning a generator and utilizing that electricity as well. So the answer to that is in the name. And I knew you guys would know all about that. So the next few slides, I'm going to quickly move on. Yeah? So we're talking about the primary energy. And this is what we see today. We see a lot of waste from electricity generation further afield. Conventional boilers are much better. You've got that kind of 80% efficiency. And I'd say even higher than that in today's world with condensing boilers. CHP looks a little bit like this, where you're getting this ratio of 35% electricity to 45% heat. And when you stack them up side by side, it looks like this. So the gain here really, and we could say maybe in, in today's world, the combined efficiency at the top there, um, you could say maybe it's 65%, okay? These figures are taken from the Carbon Trust in 2004, by the way. So let's, let's add on a bit more here for, for a more efficient society we live in. And if we looked at the um, higher heating value of 80% for CHP, you could see the saving there of about 20, maybe 25%. And from a, a primary fuel point of view, that's what we're talking about. That's why CHP fits well. From a carbon point of view, this is a marginal abatement curve from the NHS, where they've shown that combined heat and power, above any other technology or process they could implement in any hospital in the UK, has the greatest savings for carbon. That also happens because hospitals are running 24-7 with a consistent load for heat and electricity. Okay? But, but this is why CHP is coming to the fore at the moment. Okay? So, I'll move on quickly. Where does CHP work best? Well, CHP will work in most instances when you have a load for electricity and a suitable load for heat as well. And usually, there's a bit more heat in the CHP, you might have a ratio um, of about uh, 1 to 1 1.3 uh, for CHP from electricity to heat. So if you have areas like hotels, leisure centers, hospitals that are hungry for more heat, well, they will use the electricity as well all the time. Okay? So you can see here, if you, if you look around that clockwise, hotels, leisure, <laughs> schools will have a good load, but they'll have that seasonal time when they won't have a good load that summer. Uh, data centers uh, are where we would use tri-generation, where we would use absorption chilling combined with the CHP, and that gives you a, a third output from this technology. Okay. Industrial is always a good one, where there's heat demand, they have plenty of electricity they can use. Uh, district heating, as we well know. Uh, mixed developments, healthcare, uh, AD, we would, we would use the AD gases and modify the CHP so they'd burn and generate electricity. And then uh, the prison service in the UK as well. Uh, a lot of people um, in st st sticky situations. Um, this is the range for micro CHP from four kilowatt up to um, 50 kilowatt, I think in, in, the, in Europe it's defined as micro. And above 50 then is a small scale CHP and we package and manufacture that all in Manchester. Um, that's what a typical small scale CHP would look like. Uh, important thing to note is access from front and back uh, all around for maintenance. I'll keep hammering on about maintenance, by the way. Uh, CHP maintenance is, is key to keeping it going. Uh, a lot of moving parts in this engine block here, and you can see the generator, and that's the exhaust gas heat exchanger. Uh, and then the large range of CHP goes up to about 2.4 megawatt. Okay, and that's an example there of some uh, CHP configurations. These would be bespoke. And usually with, with factories, food and drink manufacturing, that kind of thing, where um, some sites are unusual, some sites need planning application, uh, some are AD plants, um, and uh, we have a lot in the commercial retail sector as well. And that's the inside of one of our large units, shows you the detail. So it's a, it's a high uh, quality build in the UK. Okay? So we've talked about CHP. What, why do we have CHP? Uh, where does it work? I know what's in the box. Well, what, what makes up a CHP? Okay, so just wonder, is that mouse working? Yep. Okay, if we start from the left to the right here, um, in this case, we're going to talk about natural gas. So the fuel in is natural gas. Air intake into the combustion engine because the engine needs to breathe the combustive fuel. And then we have the cold water return from the building. So that's usually, well, in today's world, the, the temperatures are changing all the time, aren't they? So let's say 70, 80, that kind of flow and return, okay? 
So let's take 70 degrees in here. And we circulate that water around the jacket. And as the pistons go up and down and, and burn the fuel coming in, that jacket gets warmer and it heats up the cold water. That cold water is passed through here. So let's say the cold water now is at 75 degrees as it goes into this exhaust gas heat exchanger. The exhaust gas is then passed through a catalytic converter that would clean out the NOx and carbon emissions. And then the water, you can see the color coding here, it's quite easy, isn't it? Heats up from 75 degrees to 80 degrees. It passes out to the building, and we usually have a plate heat exchanger built within the CHP as well. And we would feed as the primary boiler to feed the, the other boilers in the system then, allowing them to, to not come on as often with the CHP being the primary boiler. If we follow the same flow again and look at the gases, you could see that the, the exhaust gas has passed through here. And at this point, they're at about 620 degrees. Okay? By the time they exchange the heat with the water in the shell and tube heat exchanger here, they're coming out at about 120 degrees. And, and this is where we, we'd feed out into the atmosphere. Uh, we don't condense at that point. Some people talk about condensing to get more efficiency out of the unit, uh, but that would uh, degrade the lifetime of the unit. Uh, and there's a lot of other implications of that. So in our experience, we don't condense. We keep it at 120 degrees. The electricity generation is a bit more straightforward. You've got a coupled generator face to face with the prime mover here. So as that shaft of the engine rotates, the electricity is generated and fed out to the building. Is that okay? That makes sense? So, if you wanted to look at it in a different perspective, there's a PNID. And what we just talked about there is everything within the box. Okay? Yeah? My understanding as well is they can produce steam as well as... We can. Yep. Yeah. So this would be the setup just for low temperature hot water. We could have another tapping, you know, if you can visualize here, that we would take steam off at, a, at that high temperature then. Um, and it's, it's a different uh, setup. There's also in the horticultural industry, we can use uh, the carbon emitted as well. So there's a, there's a lot of work in, um, in uh, Holland where we do a lot of the horticultural industry so it, it becomes quad generation almost. There's um, heat, electricity, um, cooling, and the carbon output as well. Um, just to give you a kind of a cut through of one of our skids, you can see the engine there. So uh, we will go to a number of different engine manufacturers across um, Germany, um, MAN, Mercedes, uh, MTU, um, Perkins, um, so a lot of different engine manufacturers we use and we build them in to suit the size range That's what the heads look like there on, on one of the engines uh, the generators again. We, we usually stick with a, a standardized Generator there That's what the windings look with the cover removed The exhaust gas heat exchanger. That's your simple um, Shell and tube heat exchanger. It's usually the, the biggest piece of kit at the bottom and That's it going together there in the factory and then we usually include a plate heat exchanger as well to give that hydraulic break between what happens in the skid and what happens in, in the building. Okay. Um, the, the key part that we, we've worked hard on is the controlling all this. So we use a control system of our own making, um, e-power. It gives remote access into the CHP. You can do everything remotely through that. Um, a key point for us really, and, and for people like Temp Technology that manage this fleet for us, is uh, being able to remotely access and identify issues with the CHP. Or actually, in some cases, um, because of, of this kind of view, you can identify uh, flow and return temperatures from the building. Um, so if there's something not feeding the CHP correctly, you can identify that too. So it's about transparency, actually, in this modern world of digital information. So, so this is uh, freely available with all the CHPs. Uh, the one area that's kind of hard to tie down is the application component. So everything that ties into the CHP is kind of outside of our control. But uh, I've just highlighted a few points there, and uh, we're always on hand, and, and Robert as well, to talk about things like that. So when you think about the, uh, the ventilation, the gas connections, uh, the flow and return to the building, the pumps, uh, and then the heat trim radiators and heat rejection, um, 
here rejection isn't something that we uh, recommend, but sometimes it's the best thing for a client to do in a certain situation. But um, we, we could talk more about that. So um, Ken asked me to talk a little bit about the fuels for CHP, and my answer to that was, well, it's natural gas, isn't it? You know, uh, we do we do own Borgash, and <laughs> we have kind of a vested interest, but um, we do actually make CHPs for other fuels as well. Um, and I read through the SEAI, so it's pretty Paul has left. I had a few questions from, and he, he scampered off. But um, this this is a really good read. It gives you a good overview of what happens in Ireland uh, with regard to CHP. And I, I just picked out a few points. Um, and one thing that caught my eye was was yeah, natural gas is is the is the biggest fuel that's used for CHP, and it's no surprise to me really. There's no other fuel pumped into every city and and spread around in the whole country. So so why wouldn't you use it? You know. Uh, maybe in the future they'll convert it to, to something a little less fossil based and um, I'm sure you know my company will be involved in that too but uh, in the meantime CHP a CHP because it needs to run 24 7 and it can run 24 7 uh, for maximum efficiency and for maximum output well if you've got a, a clean reliable supply of gas that that's key and unfortunately it's hard to do that with a lot of other fuels, but when those fuels are available, uh, we always are available to uh, convert CHPs to run like that. So in parts of the country where they don't have gas, uh, we have a lot of LPG units. So I think down in Kerry is one area we have a lot of installed. You probably know more about it than I do, but um, that allows a kind of a, a completely off the grid setup. Um, one other area I noticed was that the the fuel input had decreased by 1.3%, so that's that primary energy saving we talked about, but the electricity output had increased. So that to me says that um, we're doing something a bit better with our technology, and CHP as a, as a, as a market is, uh, is becoming more efficient, and uh, that must be good for everybody, you know? So I'd recommend people to have a look at that, it's very good. Also, the 76% efficiency uh, has increased to 82% as well. So the figures are going the right way. Um, the, in the table of, of fuels, I, I read into it that biogas um, was the third um, in, in number of capacity. Uh, Oil-based fuels uh, at 7.5 megawatts was next, and then natural gas at 285 megawatts. Um, interesting, though, 160 megawatts of that is Aganish Illumina, or Rusal, in Limerick, so you know it, that skews the table a little bit. Okay, one thing that we we always do talk about with uh, fuel is the higher heating value and the lower heating value. Raise your hands again for everybody who knows what higher heating value and lower heating value is. Everybody, <laughs> great. Um, lower heating value. So we're getting back to a bit of thermodynamics. Yes, yeah, everybody remember doing this in college. But what we're talking about here is when the vapor is not condensed to water and the latent heat of vaporization uh, of water is not usable. So it's that point in combustion when the gas is ignited and is transforming into vapor and exploding, what amount of uh, water is left? Yeah? And some people use lower heating value. Well, if you do that, you're going to end up in a scenario where you may show efficiencies uh, greater than um, are theoretically possible, okay? So we, we would watch out for that. It's also called the net calorific value and lower calorific value, so people might be more familiar with that. Um, the higher heating value is, is probably a better way of looking at it uh, because it cannot exceed 100% as well. So this is the situation where you have um, uh, maybe a boiler uh, being expressed as 105% efficient. Well, actually, it's about 95% efficient if, if you look at it this way. Okay, this, and this assumes water is in the liquid state after combustion, which, which tends to happen. Okay, and going back to the books again, uh, we're talking about the enthalpy change for the reaction assumes a common temperature for compounds before and after combustion. And, and that makes sense when you think about it, doesn't it? Yeah? So the, the thing I use to, to remember this for myself is the higher heating value gives a lower efficiency. So it's a more realistic view. So, so what? You might be saying, so what? Well, well, actually makes makes quite a difference because if you're using the wrong values and somebody else 
has used the other value, there could be an 11% difference in the predicted cost of your fuel. And year on year, that could add up to quite a lot. Okay? Right. So, this is just a quick look at emissions in the UK. Uh, I don't hear it mentioned too often in Ireland with relation to CHP. So, I may be preempting something that might be coming down the tracks, but I thought I'd just put that in here as well since we're talking about fuel and uh, the products of, of fuel afterwards. In London, for a long time now, we've been uh, governed by the sustainable design and construction uh, documents uh, coming from the Mayor of London. And we used to fondly call this the Boris Plan because um, it was like the Boris bikes, uh, painful, and nobody really wanted to use it. But uh, it was there anyway to, to help the greater good. And in this, they talk about using uh, SCR technology. That's selective catalytic reduction. And that is a way of controlling uh, emissions. And, and a lot of new, um, I think it's like the Audi Q3 or something like that. Um, you, you use AdBlue to top up the system, the SCR in that. So it, it cleans up the emissions, the gas, as it's leaving the exhaust. It's the same thing, but on a more industrial scale. And what we end up with really is, instead of having a standard uh, NOx level, and this is measured at 5% O2, which is a very important figure, and instead of it being 500 milligrams per normal meter cubed, with, with an integrated catalyst, it is at a standard of about 250. With a low NOx catalyst, uh, which we can build into the CHP, we can get it to 50 milligrams. But selective catalytic reduction will bring it down to almost nothing, uh, 10 milligrams. Um, so it's a very, very uh, interesting system. However, uh, it does have an additional capital cost and an ongoing uh, operational cost. Uh, and it's a, it's a chemical reaction where AdBlue or uh, urea removes uh, the nasty particles and then you have to replenish that consumable. So the reason I'm saying that is that um, it does have a lot of benefits in, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, however, it's almost a bit of a sledgehammer approach that the uh, Mayor of London has taken. Uh, there could be better ways of doing this. Okay? So it's just something to watch out for. And uh, maybe some people have experience of this already. Uh, but um, I haven't seen much of it myself uh, in Ireland. But it's, it's predominant in London. London does have a pretty bad um, atmosphere, so uh, maybe that's the reason. Okay, so um, now I'm going to look at it in a different angle, and we're going to look at the CHP economics. And this is really why uh, my company has been in business for 35 years. Um, it's, it's more to do with how CHP can have a real return on investment for a client and, and how that can be created. Because we've talked about the energy costs, um, and the carbon footprint savings. But actually, there's a real return on investment here that we can have too. We build up models and we, we survey sites before um, CHP is brought there. We will look into uh, all the variables that, that will add up to a good site and identify things that may or may not suit. The main ones here are energy demand profile, so you'd all be well aware of what that is. Uh, looking at it on a thermal point of view, um, weekly, monthly data, half hourly meter reading data is gold. That, that's what we really want to see. So then we can, we can have confidence in, in what we're looking at. So it's all about the data with demand profiles. So we'll do that for heat, we'll do that for electricity, and we may do it for other things as well if it's tri-generation. So we'll take that all in and plug it into our modeling system. Spark spread, um, I'm sure you all know what spark spread is, but for the people that may not, spark spread is the difference between the cost of gas and the cost of electricity. Okay, so if it's, uh, in this example we're going to do, it's a 2.5 cent for natural gas and let's say 10 cent for electricity. So the spark spread there is 4 to 1, or 7.5 uh, differential. And that's the value of CHP. Put gas in, there's your value, and you have electricity worth that amount out. That's why CHP is, has been such a good business for us. But we need to multiply that by a lot more variables as well. So looking at the operational hours there, we talk in general to say over 4,000 hours per annum uh, running a CHP like that is where it starts to become cost effective. And that's when it gives a real return on investment. 
you can run a CHP for anything less than that or anything greater than that. Um, but about 4,000 hours is, is a kind of a, a good starting point if you're looking to make a return. Um, these are the headline uh, variables that we plug into our model. And what I'm going to do now is just run through an example where we pick an engine, we run it for an hour, we see what it costs to run it, and we see what's the value we get out on the other side. Okay, so the engine we're picking here is the 230 kilowatt electrical CHP. And as you know, with CHPs, we're always talking electrical when we, when we name them. So 230 is 230 kilowatts of electricity. And here's a snapshot of the data sheet. We get 357 kilowatts of thermal energy. And we can see the fuel input and we can see its net and gross values as well. All right, so we're going to use that information and plug it into our model. So... First of all, we're going to look at the running costs. So just to turn on the engine for one hour, what's it going to cost us? Okay. Well, it's going to cost us the gas in the first place. So for 716 kilowatts at 2.5 cent per kilowatt, it's about 18 euro. Yeah. And if we look at the O&M here, this is, a, this is a figure we worked backwards to get. So we looked at O&M is price per annum or over a five-year plan. So we divided it by five years, you know, and broke it down per hour, and it came out as three euro an hour. We can also put, I could have put in there one euro an hour, but that would be misleading. So I picked three as the more expensive operation and maintenance to give you guys a, a good uh, ballpark figure. Okay, we, we don't price per hour, so. Um, So it's that the uh, projector has just gone into the standby mode. That's handy. Um, anybody any questions? Anybody know to fix a projector? <laughs> Do the costs you have there include the over the five years the replacement, the effective rebuild of the engine after fifty thousand hours or so? Exactly. Uh, that kind of price and is three, or three, euros. three euro an hour, hour would be that kind of larger uh, expense that would build in the major overhaul at sixty thousand hours is where we would where we would say usually. So the spread of that sixty thousand hours now in experience would probably be looking to get to forty five thousand with some of them. Maybe yeah, you get to sixty thousand, but it depends on how it's maintained. A lot earlier than that. Yeah. And that would be covered in that. So that kind of price would cover uh, all parts, all labor, um, and it, there would be levels of service, then that would be agreed. So it's like a sinking fund, effectively. You put it aside and you guys would then overhaul the engine. Partly, but not a full sinking fund. It's not held, it's not held in a separate account or something. But all responsibility for availability would be on us. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. What is, what is the scale of There, the interesting thing about that is that there's no one answer I can give you because it all depends on how that uh, box was maintained. So if the generator was well maintained and the pumps and everything, and if you get to that time, so you can imagine all the components are running, running. Some of them will have a lifetime of two, three years and they'll be replaced. Or if they're not, they can have knock-on effects. So it, it's the combination of the different technologies uh, that are maintained, you know. Um, but you could just have a situation where it's just new heads. Is, is there any instrumentation on the engine that allows you to plot, find, or perhaps anticipate uh, failures? Yes. We would use the, uh, the software, and we have 200 sensor points on our engines um, to give data to show what's happening live. And, and that's that's visible to the to the client or a consultant whoever's managing that and uh, they're good questions because chp uh, operational maintenance is almost a hidden cost that some people don't know about until they see the chp on their site and and it's a big problem uh, because people think well gee that's very expensive it is very expensive maintenance if you if you multiply 
three euro by hello if you multiply three euro by four thousand hours you see straight away the scale yes. and this is not profiteering this is actually a replacement of parts getting people to say and, and uh, paying for people that are skilled in gas technology mechanical and electrical you know so um, it is a battle we fight constantly because um, people look at a CHP like a boiler you know You could almost be paying the same again. You could. Sorry, can you repeat the question up here? Because Will we give you a microphone? Sorry. Sorry, I can't start with it. Sorry about that. The projector decided to turn itself off. That's handy. <laughs> Thanks for saving me. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. Okay, the, my question was what percentage? of the overall cost of the O&M uh, make up as opposed to the initial capital expenditure? And, you, and your answer was, it could be the same, so it could be 50-50, yeah? It could be 50-50. Okay, thank you. Depending on the size of the engine and, yep. Um, and, and every engine, if you want to think about it in, a, in an example, or um, like cars, some of the engines, their maintenance would be pretty straightforward and, and not a great cost. But some of the more complicated engines, when they're turbocharged and, and have a lot more um, ancillary equipment necessary to run it, that's when it starts to get more expensive. Okay. I think we filled that there nicely, didn't we? Thanks, guys. Um, so, 1790 per hour would be the cost of the fuel input. Um, the operational maintenance would be three euros. Let's use that. Uh, that gives a 21 euro just to turn on this engine just for one hour so you're not going to turn it on for any good for any reason it needs to be adding real value to the site if we look at the savings here and the generation here of 229 kilowatts of electricity at 10 cents per kilowatt um, is 23 euro we'll say and if we wanted to run a boiler on this site that was 80 percent efficient so i've given a lower figure here not to not to over egg things and that uses gas as well, and that output was 357 kilowatts of thermal energy, it would cost you around 11 euro to run that boiler as well. So the hourly energy saving of this one CHP on site, saving you buying electricity and saving you running a boiler is about 34 euro. <coughs> okay, so taking one from the other, you could see straight away there, there's a 13 euro net saving. And if we multiply that by 7,884, we get 103,000. And I removed all of the euro signs except on this slide. I'm really annoyed at myself. <laughs> or the pound signs. <laughs> yes? Say in that example, if you now thermal out, would you still run it? Um, there would be, so look at it now. If we take away that 11 euro, yeah. it comes out at 23. So we wouldn't put it in in the first place. The, the, the euro or the, yeah, sorry? Yeah. And it's just generating electricity. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, you're better off buying in the, the power. Okay. Yep. Um, the, like, CHP becomes a good investment when you use the heat. It's just okay using the electricity. When you add in the heat, it's a real, it's a real saver. Mm -hmm. um, to really do this calculation correctly, you need to be taking the day value of energy and the marginal night value of energy, not an average, on the electricity side. Absolutely agree with you. And the other issue is that when it's calculated this way, it looks fine. But when you add the nine extra hours based on your 7,800 hours every single day of the year that it's going to run, mm -hmm. it pulls forward your replacement cost by, you know, nine... 24ths basically. Yeah, yeah. So um, the real economics for me are 
run it on day energy, if it works on day energy, run it for 15 hours a day and see how the numbers pan out and include the lifetime uh, or um, life cycle cost an analysis with the replacement of the engine after I would say 45,000 hours built in, then you have a conservative approach and then you can see if CHP really stands up. Absolutely. Yep. I take your point. I think you're totally right. Um, I should have started this by saying this is a simple uh, calculation. I if I didn't expect the projector to fail. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. No, so, but no, I, I take your point. And the, the, the debate about 45,000 hours to 60,000, that's purely dependent on the technology being used and who's maintaining it. There are two big things that need to be looked at. Um, but definitely take your points there. The, um, the 7,000 hours, just to let you know, 7AA4 is a 365 days of the year, 24 hours a day, by 90%. So that takes out 10% of the time for the O&M as well. Yeah, so that does allow for that, which, you know, the O&M really costs you. It costs you in cash, it costs you in time as well, the availability. And that's what people don't realize. Over the lifetime, 10% of its life, it will be stopped and down for maintenance. And people may query that, why is it always down? Well, it's not. It's actually preventative maintenance 10% of the time. As you know, time moves fast. But no, thank you. And, and actually, my next few slides might, might add to this as well. Because this is a very simple calculation we're doing here and a very simple payback. This was a hospital in the UK where they already had a 230 kilowatt electrical CHP installed. That was removed and a new one was put in. So we knew exactly what, what was needed here. Uh, the installation costs were very low. You could see here 165,000. So the payback in this for the NHS was fantastic. And actually, uh, in today's world, they're always looking for a payback of about three years and less. So we're fighting uh, all the time to keep that availability up. I said there 10% of the time it's down. Well, we're getting pushed now uh, for 92% availability and greater than that. So it's a constant battle between uh, early preventative maintenance, uh, like you mentioned there earlier, and identifying things before they happen and then making sure uh, nothing catastrophic happens as well. So that kind of 2.2 year payback isn't that kind of perfect scenario in this simple calculation. But where it really... Uh, needs to be analysed is, is early days and, and uh, speaking with you engineers tonight is a, is a good way of illustrating that uh, early design and early feedback into this sorry hmm. so instead of 2.2 uh, years payback which is in uh, the best case scenario we end up with something like uh, 3.9 which is that red circle there and that's if some one of the variables changed. So gas price, gas price went up from 2.5 to 4. We've no control over that. Okay, that changes the economics straight away. Payback of six years uh, refers to I think when somebody said, "What happens if we don't use the heat?" So if we only use 50% of the heat here, it pushes out the payback straight away, almost doubles it, you could say. So the heat is so important that it needs to be used. And then finally, this probably ties into what you were saying, the 5,000 hours. So instead of 7,884, 5,585 is about 17 hours a day. And in the UK, that's what we use. Um, it's to do with the day and nighttime tariff. I think that's that split for the 17 hours. So this is more like that. And this is actually, this 5,000 hours is probably every other situation that isn't a 24-hour system. So hospitals data centers and a few more 24 hours a day everything else starts at this kind of point here of about 5,000 hours so so you need to be careful um, at feasibility stage that's the point here really so it, it is relatively simple to get your head around this but to get into the fine detail uh, is a bit more uh, prolonged okay uh, how am I doing for time actually 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. 20 minutes to the vote. So, um, I'm just going to do a little bit about load profiling. So, it's just how, how do we size our CHPs? What's the kind of best way to look at it? Um, I sit on the SIBSI District Heating CHP Committee, and there's very loose guidelines on this. 
So what we've done on this set of slides is just to give an example of what we see in the market and how people are doing it. Um, what we do, and, and we, we call this method one here, is um, base load thermal. Straightforward, isn't it? Um, we size the CHP small and nimble, so it satisfies a base load all year long. It keeps it running, and all the heat is used on site. When we have peaky times of the years, you know, the, the months like now, the boilers kick in, and boilers are, are designed to, to modulate and come on and off, so it's the best way to use them. So on a, on a monthly view, um, this is how we would how we would size the CHP. Pretty straightforward, I'm sure you'd understand. Um, method two, um, it's that time where there might be a little bit of a conflict between um, maybe planning applications and partel driving carbon and carbon savings on a site. So people want a larger CHP with a larger thermal output. So instead of it being um, risk averse and at method one here, people tend to start uh, designing a larger CHP to, to maximize uh, the on-site value, uh, w which is understandable. But the problem occurs then in the summertime uh, when, when all the heat is not utilized. So some people, uh, if this was on a daily basis, you could use a thermal store, and a thermal store is always a good idea with a CHP. But on a, on a monthly basis, uh, this causes problems. Um, some answers to this are to use uh, heat trim or heat rejection radiators. Um, and there is, um, and the SEI would show that you can utilize that for a portion of the year as long as the rest of the year uh, was still within. Is it 70, 75%? So if this shaded area was no greater than 25% of the total, um, it, it still qualifies for high efficiency CHP. Uh, but ideally, you know, you don't want that. Um, so, so this is this is the hard design time when people need to pick a point between those two, and uh, and be be happy with it on your site. But also the client has something to say about that too, don't they? Because uh, they may want valuable electricity. Um, if you can imagine another chart here, they might want that electricity on site, and they might be willing to dump heat. Uh, and that's a conversation. That's a commercial conversation that needs to be had. Okay, so that's method two, thermal, and now we're going to look at uh, electrical. Okay. And, sorry, one more thermal, is where we see modulation happening. And people talk about thermal modulation. Uh, I'm mechanical. Uh, I, I kind of thought modulation was more of an electrical situation where you have instant modulation, probably with a resistor, you know. Um, so what we see here is people referring to load tracking of the thermal load. And, and actually what's really happening here, um, that heat is going into a thermal store usually or being dissipated some other way. Uh, the CHP will ramp down, it's an engine and, and all engines can, can modulate in, in a certain fashion. But heat does not instantly evaporate, it's still in the system, it's still in the engine. And if it doesn't get away, that could cause problems. So, so this is a kind of a situation that we wouldn't really, you know, promote because we can have this in our back pocket. And if we're going to design a smaller CHP at a lower capital cost, and let's say this year there was even less thermal requirement. Well, then the CHP can modulate down here. So we keep that as a backup plan. Yeah, because if we end up with the CHP here, and and if it cuts out, well, the CHP will have to cool down before it can come back on again. And that's where people have fallen into a trap if they if they expect the CHP to to map like a boiler would. Okay. Um, thermally, it's, well, electrically, it's, uh, it's 50%. It'll modulate electrically 50%. But for every 10% there, it equates to about 1 degree Celsius in your actual, in your, your live temperatures. So if you think about that, that's only 5 degrees you've got to play with on a flow and return. 
before the engine starts to um, not be able to deal with the heat that it, it is feeding back from the site and then trying to feed out yeah um, so it, it is a it is a funny one because if we're talking about electrically modulation is, is instantaneous but thermally you've got this heat lag this buildup that needs to be dissipated you know um, if you've got a huge thermal store and if you've done the calculations right or if you've got a huge heat network there's a big uh, place to dump heat you know yeah, no, it's just it's just the issue <coughs> i'm seeing in my, in my job lab is especially with the new nz the near zero energy buildings coming in yes they're putting in chps and a lot of commercial buildings are designing them where yeah. really it's just the load isn't no. there for a lot of it. so this this is the trap that yeah. that we see in the uk all the time um to be to be risk averse you're at method one mm -hmm. to be zero carbon and and you know ticking all the boxes you're at method two and that's where the problem happens and it's 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 a kind of a <coughs> it's a catch-22 really isn't it because a lot of the time um these calculations are done at planning stages for planning permission and there's no full mechanical or electrical design done yet so how is an early stage feasibility going to know what the full daily breakdown is going to be like, you know, in detail, you know. But are, are we not a little bit confusing here because this is a month-on-month -month graph. Oh, yeah, whereas yeah. Whereas the modulation is a minute-on-minute -minute graph. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, for me, the right solution really isn't method one, and it probably isn't method two either. It's somewhere between, with enough modulation to allow you to, to really operate the thing efficiently in the summertime. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. I think that's the real... Yeah. Uh, trick in the calculation. There is a, there's a real the gap. Correct on a, you know, half hour by half hour basis. There's a real gap in the information out there from all associations that, that people haven't gone into the detail to, to publish that, you know. You know, there's uh, AM12 from SIBSI, uh, AM11, sorry, from SIBSI. And, uh, and that's a good read, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get into that detail enough for me. And, and what you're saying is dead right, you know. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to go on to the kind of uh, to the minuscule timing as well. Um, and now to look at the electrical side of things. Um, again, a base load is, is where we want to be. Uh, everything in, in orange here is what uh, the site requires on on site, and the blue here is bought in from the grid. So the CHP is a flat line output again, and everything will be consumed again on an annual basis. Okay, and that's what you want to have. You want to have a CHP that feeds your site and it's not really there to do anything else. However, when things are oversized, the chart is flipped. The CHP output is up here and this is what the site is using and everything blue is uh, referred to as exporting. Um, I looked through the SEAI report there and there's only 13 sites in Ireland exporting at the moment. And I think you'll know if your site is exporting because you'll set up a, an agreement, you know. I'm, I'm living in the UK now and I know all about export agreements with all this uh, Brexit talk, you know. And uh, they're not easy to set up. So if people think that they're going to export electricity, um, I think they need to check it again. Because this I'd refer to more as spilling, just spilling onto the grid. And actually you need to get the district network operator, uh, ESP I assume, uh, to sign off on that and allow you to spill onto the grid. Maybe people are confusing that with setting up an export agreement. Uh, two very different things there. So you always want to use all the electricity on site and you're going to use that, let's say it's 10 cent worth on site. I'm sure it's a lot more than that actually, but uh, you want to use that on your site all day and all night. So now that you know everything, okay, we're going to go into the detail. And you have to be quiet now this time. All right, don't spoil it for the rest of them. Um, the devil is in the detail here. So on a daily basis, okay, this is a nursing home, okay? And we've got the electrical demand here on the left and the thermal demand here. You can see that everybody's asleep here until about 7 a.m. Big spike here, big spike in the evening. I think that's uh, TV time there, cups of teas and matlock is on, you know? And then in the, uh, in the electrical side of things, it's the same here, 7 a.m. you can see these spikes. So my question to you guys is, 
If we can put in the CHP here, and if it does everything that the CHP should, what size of CHP should we put in? So to make it a bit easier, and because I've got four minutes left, I've added these lines as well to show what kind of size CHPs you could put in here. So I don't know how we're going to get you all. You've been all so talkative. Uh, don't shout all at once, you know. But does anybody want to shout an electrical number here that would uh, pan across? And, and remember, you know, a 25 kilowatt CHP here is going to pull out about, you know, over 40 kilowatts of heat. So, who's, who's going to be brave? I'm going to be brave. You have 10 more minutes, actually. Okay. Wrong, so That's okay. This gives time now for people to digest all the information and to surprise me with your knowledge. Good man. 25? Down here? Okay. Have we got any? You're going for 10? Very risk averse down here at 10? E35. E35? Okay. Any higher? Any higher bids? I like this. We're getting maybe up to 50 or saying maybe. That's the way. If we had a tomato growing greenhouses out the back as well, we could go higher too, couldn't we, you know? Depends on your as well. Good point. Yeah. If we were selling back to the grid too, you know, if, if, this, if these guys had a kind of a, a capacity market agreement, they could put anything they want in. You know? So there's, there's a lot of other stuff here to think about. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I did have a guy one time, um, and I showed him this, and he said, uh, you know, 90 all the way. And he said, uh, I don't care. I just want to, this electricity is costing me a fortune. I just want to, you know, get the electricity paid for it. Add heat, dump the heat, you know. And, you know, the client is the client, you know. But um, the special prize goes to the man here on, on the right, uh, for the 35. Round of applause? No? <laughs> so it's, it's quite a, a sensible approach here. And, and on a daily basis, I like to think of these white inverted triangles here as where the thermal store would be filling up. And this, this block here, if we kick in the CHP at, at 5 a.m., it starts to, to help the site. Oh, Jesus. Excuse me. Uh, I'm not touching it. And so the thermal store is essential on a site like this. Electricity used all day and all night. But also, this is not a big capital cost uh, for that nursing home. And that's important, too. We've got to think about it as a lifetime cost. Yeah? Um, what we're trying to do, really, in general, is reduce utility costs. Right? And, and you, know, you guys know these principles from good engineering practice. Um, anything we could do on site to reduce it even further, we do that first then we make things more efficient in the plant. Okay, so proper audits are, are the way to go forward. And then at the end of all that, a CHP might be an idea. But we don't want to be people putting in a CHP of this size in, in that kind of you know, hope that we're a, a silver bullet in solving all the energy efficiency issues. You know? CHP needs to be installed in the right situation at the right time and knowing that everything else has been done so that, you know, lighting upgrades have been done so that the electricity load isn't demolished two years into a, a 10 year agreement, you know, and these things have happened in the past. And that's why CHP sometimes had been uh, people looked at it unusually. But it, for me, it's a matter of education. And I think you guys are, are headed the curve on that. Um, my last points here really are about uh, metering and getting good data. It's key. And it's key this is all done at early feasibility stages. Yeah? We need to know what we're doing really early uh, before we you know, do anything. It's, it's, it's so important. Um, because when contracts are out there, it's too late. When planning permission is done, it's too late. Um, I think that's about it. Um, I think just about on time. So if anybody has any questions, I can take questions now. Um, Thank you. And I'll be around the corner later as well. Uh, just ask a question. I'll give you the microphone so people online can hear your questions as well. Uh, 
The smallest unit you had there, I think, was four kilowatts electrical. What typically would that be? What sort of a size would that be? The smallest one we actually have is 2.3 kilowatt electrical. And do you mean physically? Yeah, well, what, I mean, what sort of an installation? Is it sort of domestic? Is it... It's kind of a commercial kind of, so it, it, it's, um, it's a product designed uh, for the German market uh, where they have uh, much more incentives on CHP, so they actually use it domestically. But, but in the UK and Ireland, it would be a bit too much for domestic, you know. That's a, I think it's 2.3 kilowatt with a, something like five uh, thermal output then, you know. Um, but yeah, it's quite an interesting piece of kit and it's probably just a little bit bigger than this plinth here, you know. Um, for a large petrol station. Oh, right, okay. For, so Robert says for a large petrol station or kind of commercial thing like that, yeah. yeah. Like your group of offices or something together, like you know, they might, they might use it. Yeah. Okay, Is there any other questions? Thanks for your... We'll pass over the mic there. So how efficiently you feel that the CHP can be implemented in the countries where uh, it is warmer? Probably, yeah. Because um, most of the heating which is generated from the CHP couldn't be used for heating because they don't need the heating issue. They wouldn't have the heating issue. Yeah. So where that excess heat can be used uh, because uh, that's where because of the excess the usage of the heat was the more making the chp more efficient yes so if that is not used in the warmer countries yes. so how do you think that uh, it could be efficient in the we have installations of tri generation okay where we would couple it with uh, absorption chilling technology so then all of that low temperature at water can be turned into cooling uh, but it's at about six degrees. I think it might go as low as four degrees, maybe. Four. Yeah, four degrees. So it's not uh, down to the lowest temperatures, but but four degrees. So so we do see that. Uh, but also it depends on the the big thing with different countries is the spark gap. So it's that cost of natural gas. So the lower the cost of natural gas and the higher the electricity, the more viable it is. And a good example of that is America at the moment. So we opened up a new. Um, it's gone again. Uh, we opened up a new uh, factory and offices in America because their spark gap was eight to one. So uh, in Ireland and the UK, it's about five to one. And that's really good for every one unit in, you're, you're quadrupling that, you know. Um, so, so spark gap, you know, and, and so natural gas, if, if the natural gas is plentiful and, and it's a secure supplier are the big things. But yeah, well, you could use the low temperature at water for... Um, you know, showers and, and for okay. hot water applications, but but not for heating is what you're saying, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, actually, like as you said, it can be used uh, very much in the commercial area. So uh, it is not uh, very feasible for the domestic uh, purpose right currently. Domestic is a challenging market for CHP. You're right. Yeah, because uh, I know like every uh, people stay at home. So I think if you go into the homes implementing this, uh, there. Uh, the amount of efficiency could be greater than uh, a commercial one, right? Yes. Yeah, we domestic. Um, so small scale domestic CHP is probably a very, very hard market. Uh, large scale district heating, on the other hand, where electricity can be utilized or exported happens in London and places where you've got maybe a two megawatt CHP exporting its electricity to the grid, uh, making a valuable return and then uh, the district heating loop fed by the, the CHP. So it becomes a, a valuable ESCO then. Um, but but on, a, on a small scale, it, it doesn't really pan out that well, you know. So when you are saying this, I just got a small idea. So like most of the people drive the cars to their home. So if it is a long driven, so they can use the car engine because it has a, it generates heat as well, right? So that heat can be implemented, uh, can be used in heating the home as well, right? That can be used a, a, a little way off as a domestic as well, right? If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're, uh, you need to talk to Mr. Tesla and uh, a few <laughs> mechanical engineers as well. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that will uh, pick up on that one with you, you know, but, uh, but I don't have any experience of that. Okay, thank you. Cheers, thank you. Just one other thing actually is in large scale manufacturing where you've got a constant process load, 
like steam yeah, or absolutely, food yeah. where you have dryers, then CHP as well would be very beneficial because you would have constant heating load and the constant electricity load. Yeah. Manufacturing 24-7, distilleries, food and drink beverage, that kind of thing is, is where we see a lot of uh, CHP. And a lot of these sites already exist. They've, they've existed since they started up because engineers like yourselves probably work there, you know. So, um, so yeah. Thanks for coming along, everybody. A cold night and all, but uh, it's nice to meet you all. And keep in touch. Um, I've left cards at the back. Grab one. Uh, I do stuff on LinkedIn. And yeah, questions are welcome. Cheers. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to John and thank you to Paul. Thank you.